Hello, beautiful soul. Welcome to my podcast or my YouTube channel. I'm your host and guide, Will Caminada, and I'm here to help you awaken, heal, and expand your consciousness. And today, it's a conversation episode. I had the pleasure to talk to Dr. Linda Backman. Dr. Linda Backman is an expert teacher, regression therapist, and licensed psychologist with 44 years of private practice experience, including over 25 years guiding soul regressions. She has three books, Souls on Earth, The Evolving Soul, and Bringing Your Soul to Light. So in this conversation, we talked about her spiritual awakening, her experience through grief, and how she went from being a psychologist, a traditional psychologist, into a past life regression therapist. So obviously we talked a lot about past life uh, regressions. Why it, is it benef beneficial? Why would you want to do one? What's the healing aspect of it? And then we talked about the different types of souls on earth, earth-based souls, the interplanetary souls, and the angelic realm souls. And we even talked a little bit about um, the play Adians. So I think you're going to love this conversation. It's fascinating subject. And if you enjoy it, please share this episode with that one friend who's going to love it. And don't forget to subscribe and like and enjoy the show. Hi, Linda. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I am super grateful um, for you uh, making the time to come here and super excited to talk to you about past life soul regression and the different types of souls on earth, which is actually the title of your latest book. <laughs> um, and just before we get into that, I'd love for you to give a little bit of introduction um, to your story. I love starting the interview asking about the guest's spiritual awakening because I think we can all relate to the story in one way or another. So um, you are a um, psychologist, also regression therapist. I assume that the psychology came first. So tell us a little bit, why did you become a psychologist and how, how did the past life regression happen in your life? Okay, well, I'll try to not make it some huge long story. Um, so, it, you know, it's interesting, Will, because when I work with clients, I always say to clients that they kind of come in two flavors. Um, spiritual clients that come for regression, um, it, one flavor, it, it, you might say flavor, is the client that knew there was more than this life, this body, almost from childhood. Um, or the unique client, this always is uh, kind of fascinating to me, that sometimes I have a client where they were a teenager and they were being handed, you know, their parents or parent was handing them a spiritual book. That's not my story. And I'm not that flavor. I'm the, what I would say, the, the other flavor of spiritual, uh, how, how I became spiritually awake, basically. So, um, I didn't believe in any of this until I was in my middle 40s. So you're right, Will. Um, I, I moved into the field of psychology and working with clients in a conventional mode. Um, started sort of triggered back in my 20s um, through the challenging experience that I later learned was sort of scheduled on my path of the birth of a premature uh, baby uh, of mine that was born and lived a short time and died. I became passionate about death, dying and grieving, but I didn't understand soul or reincarnation or any of what we're gonna discuss today. 20 years later, after I became a psychologist, so in my middle forties, I had a very close friend and colleague die from a type of lung cancer in his early 30s. And when he passed completely 
out of the blue, completely surprising to me. He began to talk to me from the other side, which, you know, it was sort of like I was flipping back and forth between these two different emotions. One was I was fascinated. It's like what happens when we die and how is it you're talking to me and how does that work? And then another part of me thought, oh, this is really weird and and strange and what do I do with this? I knew a little bit about reincarnation at that point, not a great deal. And this, of course, is now almost 30 years ago. Um, Not only was my colleague talking to me from the other side, but he was showing me past lives we had shared. So I thought either I'm just making this up, which sort of in my heart of hearts, I knew I wasn't. Um, and, And so I said to my husband, who is still my husband, um, we had never talked about spirituality. We've always been pretty progressive people, but we never had talked about spirituality. So I said to my husband, um, I need to tell you what's going on with me. And if you think this is really strange and weird, just tell me and I'll try to forget about it. And so I explained to, to my husband what was going on, especially the past life piece. And he said, oh, okay. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean just, oh, okay. And he told me something he had never told me before. We'd known each other for many years, even almost 30 years ago, we'd known each other for probably 20 to 25 years. And so he said, when I was a boy growing up, I remembered my past lives in detail. And I said to my husband, are you just now remembering this? And he said, yes, I guess I just tucked that away. He said, I never told anybody about it. I thought they would think I was a strange child. Um, And so literally my husband said, if you're interested in this, go for it. So that's kind of how that all happened. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Um, And as you were sharing your story, I, couldn't help but relate to some of the things you you mentioned because I think that you know grief and pain have this power to be the catalyst for this spiritual awakening. And uh, my dad passed away when I was eight, and mm. at the time I didn't have this awareness of what is spiritual awakening, but. Like you, I was also asking those questions like what happens when when, when we die? Is there an afterlife? Can mm-hmm. I talk to him? And this questioning, I think, is really powerful as well, because I think it's like the first, if one of the first steps of that spiritual awakening. Yes, totally. And, and what I know today, it's almost like... Um, or maybe forget the almost, our guides bring something forward. Our guides bring an experience. It's almost like, you know, dangling something in front of, of our of our eyes or in front of our experience and our emotions. And then we have free will in terms of, well, what do we do with, um, just like you, it's like, well, what happens when we die? And what is the soul? And where do we go? Where do we come from? Um, So I, you know, basically, for me, um, I ultimately made what back then was a difficult choice. It was like, okay, you know, sort of talking to myself, okay, Linda, if you, um, you could continue as a conventional psychologist, or you could dive into this world of soul and spirituality and past lives and karma and dharma and i was too fascinated Mm -hmm. Um, or or maybe you know it's almost like there's a a push from behind of go in this direction so that's what happened yeah do you feel like um your friend who um had passed away and he was showing um, you mentioned past lives that you guys had together. Do you think that he was the one, one of the the guides, like pushing you into this direction? Oh yes, I, I, I mean I think that's probably totally accurate because now, so many years later, I know a lot about my own past lives. I know a fair amount about certain souls. Um, 
who are people I either know or have known in my life that I now understand, you know, why someone, whether it's friend or family member or neighbor or or mentor, um, why they can have such an impact on us. So yes, I I think that, I mean, I, I, you know, it's interesting when you ask that question, Will, I always um, hesitate because my colleague was married, my colleague had a child, he was a respected psychologist. Um, So I never want to say, well, it was all, you know, the experience he was bringing forward for me, because I'm sure that's not the case. But I think that's an aspect of of why it all happened with his passing yeah and also because i guess you were open to it as well and so you were receiving the information and what let's talk about the past life soul regression and just to give a little bit of like structure or foundation for the viewer or the listener uh what is a past life soul regression and what would be the reason and the benefits from having a session or from learning about your past life? Yes, that's a great question. And if if I may, I'm going to expand that um, to, I actually guide two different types of regression. And um, I do guide past life soul regression. And the purpose of, of that um, is to discover an important past life of ours that our guides choose for us to learn about. Our spiritual guides bring forward, if I'm guiding a past life soul regression, um, I always say to the client, I don't choose the past life. Your guides, which includes our higher self, your guides choose the past life and that past life is directly related to life today. So that's past life soul regression. Um, uh, almost more often than guiding past life soul regression, probably, yes, in fact, more often, I guide what I call between life soul regression. So between life soul regression is a longer regression, simply an expansion beyond past life soul regression, where I guide the client into relaxation, the client discovers whatever past life they're meant to understand and learn about, we go all the way to the death scene. Um, I always sort of jokingly say to the client, you're going to die in this session today, but you're not going to obviously physically die. You're you're going to die. And then we're going to follow that natural soul journey that happens every time we pass in a in a in a life and in our past lives. Then with the client, um, we travel that journey where that slice of soul that causes us to be alive in each one of our in each one of our incarnations that slice of soul automatically speeds up its frequency steps out of our body and because it's it's a fractal it's a holographic portion of our soul um that aspect of our soul returns sort of people can think about it as a literal uh journey from 3D into fourth dimension or the astral plane and then to fifth dimension and beyond or the spiritual realm and the clients that piece of their soul um merges with the totality of their soul and the between life soul regression then we learn about guides um soul intentions for life today, how we planned our current life, whether we're a soul that has had most of our lives on earth or not, the client learns what their guides want them to learn about themselves as a soul and in life today. Mm -hmm. So you would say maybe like the main reason is for them to have a better human experience you go out into the 4D or 5D, but then you come back here so that you have maybe more clarity or answers. Would you say that this is why most people look for for you for this kind of work? 
Yes, because the bottom line is understanding um, why am I here in life today? Uh, how and why did I plan my life? What's the reason for emotions I have, physical issues that I have, um, people in my life, fears, phobias, intentions, skills, um, and so we learn who are we as a soul in body, but the client also learns um, who are they as a soul in regard to um, where they are in their soul's evolution, who are their guides, um, what is their higher self, their soul doing when they're in body. It, it, it just expands basically from there. Mm -hmm. So I guess... Most people look for for healing. It's a healing therapy, right? Yes, it's 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 why am I who I am? Um, for what reason did this person come into my life? Um, for what reason did I have to face this health issue? What is that about? Um, how are my past lives affecting my current life? Um, how do, what's the purpose of a deja vu experience? Um, what's the purpose? Oh my gosh, it just goes in so many directions. Um, what, why do I have so much trouble being in body? Um, why do I have trouble dealing with toxins in the environment? Um, for what reason am I in a challenging relationship with my child, with my partner, yeah, with my this? Like, is relationship yeah. like a big topic? Like, people want to understand why I'm in this relationship, or you know, if, if I'm in the right relationship, even, or what's the reason? Yes, yes. And when the client comes to the between life soul regression, they they bring a moderately short list of specific questions they hope their guides will answer. And yes, commonly, it's like, um, why do why am I having a talking with a friend the other day about this, you know, uh, why does my child not understand me? Why can't I um, have a comfortable relationship with my child? Um, oh, you know, I, I'm sure you know this, Will. We do so much, so often we, we denigrate ourselves so much. It's like, what's the matter with me that I don't have a long-term satisfying romantic relationship? Well, there's all kinds of answers to that. Um, perhaps we didn't plan in life today to have a longstanding romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we needed to be romantically connected to someone for X length of time because we were working out issues from a past life. And when we complete, the the balancing of those issues then we can let go of that relationship and move on and often the much more um comfortable warm cohesive relationship comes forward so you know it's extremely broad what comes forward for every client because it's sort of like you know uh, our soul is like a thumbprint our soul is like our soul energy holds the experiences or is, you know, is impacted by all of our past experiences. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned briefly uh, karma. Can you comment on that a little bit? Because I feel like it's a word that's thrown out there very often. And sometimes we have a, a misunderstanding of what it really is. What's what's your take on it? Yeah, that's great. That that that's that's a great great question. Um, well, okay. So one thing I know from having guided multiple clients a week, most weeks for I don't know, 26, 27 years, is that um there's a uniqueness when we come into body on earth. And the uniqueness, one of the unique qualities is that we have free will. 
So when we come here, as you probably know, when we come here, we have free will. Um, there are plans, perhaps pre-birth plans that we can go against, that we can just say, well, I don't want to be with that person, or I don't want to have a friendship with that person. So karma simply means that through my own free will choices in past lives, I made decisions that probably weren't the most useful, weren't the most, you know, evolutionary for my soul. And I have the opportunity, usually multiple times, multiple lifetimes, to clean up um, those free will choices. That's karma. Right. And so do we have um, options? Like if we don't fulfill our karma in this lifetime, do we have another chance to come back and sort of evolve? Or I don't know if like graduation comes to mind, but I know it's a very linear way of thinking, <laughs> but that's kind of how we understand things. Right. And and yes, and we could talk about, so is there such a thing as graduation? We certainly can, can chat about that. But um, yes, and what happens is that as humans, we, we, we incarnate in these human bodies with these human brains, and then we become judgmental of ourselves, almost like overly left-brained, overly, you know, cognitive about did I make the right choice? Is, or did I make the wrong choice? And so, yes, we have almost unlimited opportunity, meaning this life and beyond this life, to um, clean up karma. I, I know that when we finish a lifetime, it is pretty routine for us then to come upon um, a panel of guides or teachers. And when we complete a lifetime, we come upon this benevolent panel, not malevolent panel, because I think everybody thinks, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to be told I did this wrong and I did that wrong and all that. So we come upon this panel and the panel, because I've heard this in so many regressions, the panel basically says, I mean, like they might say to you, Will, or they might say to me, you know, they'd say, well, okay, Linda, this life you just completed a life. How do you think it went? What they're looking for is transparency. As long as we're transparent, so we might say, well, I think I did a pretty decent job um, as a parent. I think I did a pretty decent job being open to building friendships. But you know, I don't think I did so well. Um, I could have done better with um, uh, being attentive to my grandmother when she was dying or following more of my heart in terms of the kind of work that I really love to do. Instead, I stayed, you know, a little bit stuck as a CPA for 20 years when what I really wanted to do was you know, retool as a massage therapist or whatever. So what our guys are looking for is transparency. And if we give them transparency, rather than trying to bluff them, they're pleased. Right. So is it like we do a life review and we check the points that needs improvement, perhaps, um, and we kind of have a soul contract for the next lifetime. They're kind of like that in linear yeah. way. It, it sounds like it sounds like you're saying, um, does our so after we have this review, which yes, life review is a great way to put it. Um, uh, then does how our does how our life review you know goes relate to how we plan the next life? Yeah. The answer is yes. Uh, and yet, um, let me see how to say this. It's a little bit more complex than that because we we can have, um, and this is where I know you and I are probably going to chat about this, um, because 
if we're a soul that comes to earth primarily, then, and that's what I call an earth-based soul. So if we're a soul that primarily incarnates on earth, then we can have hundreds or a thousand or more lives. So I say that because when we plan an upcoming life and we sit down with our guides to plan that life, um, we may pull from um, we may pull from circumstances five lives ago where we could have done better about something. So it isn't necessarily we're just planning an upcoming life based on the most recent past life and how that went. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. And I have two questions. Okay. Uh, is so this, this life upcoming life plan, how flexible is it? And is there such, such a thing as graduation as we, mentioned in a little bit so when you say um just just qualify for me so i know exactly what you're asking um when you say how flexible are you talking about do we have to stick with that plan and if we plan to come into body and use our musical skills and be you know become a, a lifelong musician but we get into body and then we maybe decide you know, making our living as a musician is not what we choose. Is is that kind of what you're saying? Yes. And and also um maybe like we're getting into the like the, the fate or destiny theme. And and I'll just talk briefly about like how I feel. Um because when I look back in, in my life so far, I think there was a reason why my dad passed away. At, at such an early age and when I was so young but I also sometimes question did he really have to go that early could mm. maybe could have he could have gone later if something else had happened if uh, if I had realized some something else or if my family as a as a unit had healed something else do you know mm -hmm. where, where mm -hmm. I'm kind of going? Yeah, I, 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 I think so. Um, so, and if this doesn't answer your question, just ask me again. That's totally fine. Um, one of the things I think that we're talking about and that you're basically saying is, or asking, is there a specific, um, before we come into body, is there a specific plan for when we're going to die mm -hmm. yeah or is that flexible yeah that's yeah. good yeah <laughs> yeah yeah okay perfect perfect so um the answer is that it varies soul to soul and lifetime to lifetime so we may come into body okay you know it's, it's like complicated answers to try to make them simple and straightforward. Um, there are times, and, and this is, you know, this is where the uh, therapist in me, the psychologist in me um, that, that has done a lot of grief, grief therapy uh, where I get um, cautious and, and a little bit tentative. So there are times when a life is planned, we come into body, we're born into that lifetime and we may plan only to stay until age 13 mm -hmm. or until age 23 or, you know, whatever, um, for a reason, with purpose. And in fact, that's what happens. Um, when we pass, the point in time that we pass may be completely related to our own soul's journey and have nothing to do with anyone else in our life. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when we pass, it's almost like if we've reached a level of soul evolution, um, of 
at, at not just being a, a learner, in other words, not just coming into body to grow and evolve and grow and evolve. Um, if we've evolved to a certain degree of, of soul evolution, we may come into body to be more of a teacher than a learner. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, 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 that's quite common. But then I'll just add that um, oftentimes when we pass is not scheduled and is, or is not, you know, sort of almost set in stone in some of our lifetimes, when we pass is a, we might just say an on the fly decision um, that's decided at the soul level. Right. It's almost like, you know, I, I you may have had this experience as have I with people. I think about my, my dad, when he passed, um, it felt to me like for about 18 months before he died, and he died much later in life, he died as a much older person, he died at age 88. But I'm fairly sure he sort of, this is the way I put it, he walked up to the doorway, um, you know, had a health scare or something like that, walked up to the doorway, so to speak, um, to pass and change his mind. Mm -hmm. And then six months later, that happened again. And, and actually that happened, I don't know, it's hard to remember. He's uh, passed about 18 years ago. I would say that happened at least two to four times before he actually left his body at age 88. So it varies a lot. Yeah. And I guess it, it goes into the, the different feel of time, right? How we feel time is very linear. And I guess in the spiritual realm, when you start going up the dimensions, it starts to become more expanded. Um, and actually, I have a question about that because I've I've heard the term parallel lives too. Mm -hmm. um, is it the same as past life? Can we use them um, in the same sense or they're different things? Okay. Yeah. Again, great question. Um Okay, let me just comment just quickly because this this may help listeners. As as a soul, our entire purpose is to evolve, and it's just like a child is born and somewhere around the age of five or six they begin school, and they have to be educated in most states in the United States, most countries in the world there are laws that say children have to be educated. Um, it's the same for a soul. A soul starts out as a very young, um, you might say immature soul, lacking perspective, lacking uh, higher wisdom. And lifetime to lifetime to lifetime, um, we grow and evolve by tripping and falling and picking ourselves back up and, and, and moving forward. So that is why we incarnate. Um, in terms of the notion, so the terms that a lot of people use, one term is parallel lives, another term is split lives. So parallel lives tends to mean, um, it, it would be like if I use myself as an example, um, parallel lives would mean in the past, I had two past lives that overlapped in time and not necessarily, you know, exactly overlapped by like it, in both lives, I was born on the same day and I died on the same day, just some kind of um, overlap of time. Mm -hmm. uh, it also happens and some of these things surprise people. And yet I find it so totally fascinating and purposeful we can have what you call split incarnation. Split incarnation means that Linda or Will, um, we currently have, uh, we're in body in, we have two different embodiments, if you will, two different incarnations, different purposes. You know, we can, one person can live in Greece and the other can live in Iowa, uh, male, female, um, so we can have split incarnations. We only have split incarnations when we are evolved to a certain point as a soul 
where we can manage the the energetics of two lives at one time. So mm-hmm. split lives are for the purpose of evolving faster. They're also for the purpose of impacting humanity in a greater way, because that's another key purpose of why we come into body is to aid the evolution of humanity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like same soul split into different um, lives at the same time as we perceive time, but it's nothing related to twin flames, right? Well, that, yeah, it, it's interesting because I was chatting with a friend about this just the other day. Um, here's what's tricky is that if you get three authors or three spiritual teachers or whatever, they may have three different, um, when they when each of them uses the term twin flame, those three teachers may have a different meaning. So um, when I use the term twin flame, what I mean by that is that there's another soul, not my same soul, there's another soul with whom I've had many, many lives with, and uh, that other soul is is a soul I'm very familiar with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But some people use twin flames to mean split incarnation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Heard that. Well, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Um, I had another question um, about this. Oh, the, the the parallel life can it also be a, a future point a few or a future life as we perceive like future can we also use that term to talk about a future life sure sure it, it could be like um linda still so 15 years from now linda still alive um but a, another we might say slice of my soul or aspect of my soul um yeah it, it it's like someone else is already born and they are a slice of the same soul that i am mm-hmm. does yeah. it ever happen with one with your clients that they go into the future either in this lifetime or a future lifetime on rare occasion yes And the reason it's rare, this is to the best of my understanding, the reason it's rare is because, so we evolve in real time. And I think that's a really important point because a lot of people, I think, misunderstand that. So we evolve in real time. Therefore, what's happening in our life right now will impact a future incarnation, will impact um, how we plan that life. Um, it, it, it's just like, you know, if in ninth grade you take algebra and in 10th grade you take geometry, which I know the school systems, that's the way I w- went through it. It's not that way anymore. I know that from my own grandchildren. Um, but so that that you have to take algebra before you take geometry, um, theoretically. So that's why our future lives are not set in stone as yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a really important uh, piece of information to remember that it it's not set in stone, like the future right. is not set in stone. Right. And you explain yeah. it in such a clear way. That's amazing. Thank you. Let's talk about the types of souls on earth, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I did a little bit of research i read um parts of your book um the the latest one and so i've learned that you talk about three different types so it's the Mm -hmm. earth-based souls right planetary souls which you call ip souls and the angelic realm souls could you tell us a little bit about them and then maybe yes on one yeah, totally. I I think that the reason will that I through my clients that I've learned about these three types of souls is because I was 
um, not only meant to be able to talk about it, but um, meant to understand how are these three types of souls different, especially when they come into body on earth in order to assist them to cope and in order to assist the client to move forward in their current life. So, um, okay, let me see if I can make this not overly complicated. So if someone is an earth-based soul, I, I actually am an earth-based soul. So I comprehend earth-based souls probably as well as anything. Um, if we are an earth-based soul, what that basically means is that we probably have been incarnating on earth for tens of thousands of years. We came from um, somewhere else originally. Our soul came from somewhere else in the celestial realm originally, as did mine. Um, but once we incarnate here, not a hundred percent, but probably like 90 to 95 percent of the time, we come into body on earth. And so our lives are almost exclusively on earth. And this is where we evolve. So that's an earth based soul. I could say more about that, but we can come back to that if you want. Um, then through my clients, I've learned there are two other types of souls that um, sort of have somewhat different qualities and somewhat different challenges. So an interplanetary soul, and uh, you know, sometimes people wonder, well, where did I get that term? Um, that term was given to me um, through clients and through my guides. And But you could equate that term interplanetary soul to ET or starseed, mm -hmm. those kinds of terms. It all, from my perspective, it all means the same. An interplanetary soul is a soul that has gained the bulk of their evolution somewhere other than on Earth because they come from somewhere else in the somewhere other than Earth. They come from somewhere else in the universe that is a culture that is already evolved. Humanity, as I think most of us know, is not has not reached a level of of high evolution uh, as yet mm -hmm. um, is struggling to get there <laughs> get uh, in my, in my opinion. <laughs> and um, so an, an IP an interplanetary soul comes to earth for basically one reason. And that is because they come from an advanced culture in a myriad of, you know, from a myriad of places in the universe. Mm -hmm. But in, if we put soul evolution on a scale like from zero to 10, when an interplanetary soul agrees to come to Earth, we're never forced to incarnate. An, an IP soul is usually at least a seven on a 10 point scale of evolution because we need their perspective. We mm -hmm. need the wisdom of their evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's an IP soul. I work with a lot of interplanetary souls in my practice um, because they are, IP souls are skilled, gifted in various ways and challenged because they're not used to being on earth and they're not used to operating in these kind of bodies that we have on earth and using this kind of brain that we have on, on earth. And so IP souls struggle a fair amount, it varies person to person, but struggle a fair amount with things like um, autoimmune issues, um, dietary issues, um, autistic spectrum um, issues, ADHD, um, energetic sensitivities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So and how yeah, about the the um, angelic rom are they similar to the IP souls? Great question. In many ways, no. They are different again. So an angelic soul comes from the obviously comes from the angelic realm. The angelic realm serves the divine. Um, you can pick your terms. Some people would want to say the source. Um, I tend to use an Eastern term called the Manu. So my understanding of 
the um, the higher force that works to coordinate Earth. That is a group soul of highly evolved souls that came together in a group when intelligent incarnation began on Earth. There's a um, I like to say a cadre, there's a group of um, souls that belong to the angelic realm who serve um, the divine force. The divine force, if we really kind of boil it down and put words to it, the divine force is all about love and compassion. Mm. So when an angelic soul agrees to incarnate, which is rare, but happens because I've learned about it from clients who are angelic souls, um, the, the core purpose is to bring a deeper love and compassion perspective that I think is truly insufficient on our planet. Um, that's why an angelic soul comes to earth. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question that maybe might be too long of an answer, but feel free to sum it up. Um, out of these three types, what would be the main characteristics um, for anybody listening or watching that they could go, oh, I think it seems like I'm on Earth based soul or an IP soul. Um, and I know there might be many different characteristics, but like what are the, the main characteristics that people can refer to? Obviously, if they go into a regression with you, they'll be more sure, but just so that they can, you know, have a feeling of potentially uh, what kind of soul they are. Yes. Okay. Um, great question. Um, so if someone is an earth-based soul and if they're spiritually aware, spiritually interested, you know, interested in your work, interested in my work, then they're not a young soul. So if we talk in just a second about, you know, what I call EB soul earth-based, um, an earth-based soul that wants to delve into what you talk about, what I talk about, um, they are not a young soul or they wouldn't be interested. And, and that's fine. We've all been young souls. So, you know, it's like you have to go to first grade and second grade and so forth. So um, an earth-based soul interested in spirituality is probably at least a, a six on a scale of 10, maybe more than that. And uh, and as I said, I'm an earth-based soul myself. So we as EB souls do have some challenges um, dealing with life and body. Those challenges are usually augmented, or we might say on steroids, if you're an IP soul or an angelic soul. Largely because, again, using myself as an example, I've just been here so many times. Am I sensitive to certain kind of food? Yes. Um, uh, am I sensitive to energy that periodically makes my, you know, sleep disturbed? Yes. But I'm not as challenged by certain things as an IP or an angelic realm soul is. So, um, trying to kind of split apart defining angelic realm souls. If a listener is an angelic soul, they are probably, it's always hard to put words to this, they are probably very focused on love and compassion, very focused on why do people argue with each other? Why do we walk into a group of people and create judgments in our heads? Why do people argue? Um, why can't they just figure out that everyone is a loving, compassionate being? Um, so an angelic realm soul is a very warm, you know, now I'm pulling up in my brain examples of, of people that I know well who are angelic realm souls. They're often the warmest kindest, most caring, 
available almost if they're not careful to a fault Mm. because they drain themselves too much but they are just very accepting kinds of people Mm -hmm. an ip soul is not necessarily like that now the way that the the qualities of an ip soul depend on where that ip soul comes from Mm -hmm. Uh, depend on where is their home base and what's the nature of the culture at their home base. But an IP soul is usually fascinated with the universe, fascinated with the night sky. Often an IP soul will say to me, you know, when I was a kid from about age four to about age 10, I just stood by the window and looked out at the night sky sometimes for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. Um, So an IP soul is very wise spiritually, usually has very significant gifts of some sort, but as I said, often struggles with numerous um, health issues and sensitivities because they're simply not used to dealing with what we, you know, the, the foods and um, additives and toxins that exist um, on our planet Earth. Love it. And your IP souls client, do they ever tell you where they, they're from? Like, do they mention names, planets, star systems, races? Yes, I, I'm glad you're asking me that. Um, so... Often, if I'm guiding a client, now, there are many times, Will, when a client comes for a regression, they don't even know they're an interplanetary soul. Or there are sometimes they suspect it, and then others do know. But sometimes when they come for um, uh, the longer regression, they the client learns their IP, and they've never even considered that. And one of the most common experiences that happens in the regression for an IP soul is when I guide the regression, the client usually goes directly to their home location Mm -hmm. and they get to spend time where they come from. So it would be sort of like, it would be like the uh, American person who has been raised in the Midwest, maybe raised in Iowa and never left Iowa. And then suddenly they have to go live in the middle of Manhattan or they have to go live in the middle of Beijing. And it's like, what, what, what's this all about? Why are these people behaving or eating or, you know, whatever. So when I guide a, an IP soul, almost always in the regression, they spend time during the regression at their home location. Um, now people ask me, well, what's common, Linda? Is it Pleiades? Is it Arcturus? Is it Orion's belt? I was going to ask you. <laughs> yeah. And, and what I have to say is yes, on occasion, it is those familiar or, you know, those locations where we know the name, but often my clients come from places where there isn't a name that's even familiar to us because there are so many possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Is it possible that their home um, is more than one? Like maybe in one regression, they might regress to the play eighties and then the next one it's the Arcturus. Yes, that again is an awesome, I I, I always think I said this to you before we started, I knew we'd be guided to talk (laughs) about what we need to talk about. Um, So IP souls vary. Some IP souls come from a location and that's where their higher self resides, period. And when that Um, we'll just use the Pleiades as an example. If I'm working with a Pleiadian client and when the client um, finishes current life, that slice of their soul that's in their body, it returns back to the Pleiades. But I also have IP clients who, um, actually I I was learning this just the other day from a, a new client. One example would be this client started out somewhere we might say very far away from earth and very, very different from earth. And when 
her soul began to prepare to possibly come to earth, then her guides led her to spend time in more than one IP location that gradually those locations were somewhat more similar to earth to help prepare her. Mm -hmm. Um, There are also IP souls of a couple of people that I've worked with a fair amount. Um, They've been labeled as traveler souls, which means they're IP, IP souls, but labeled as traveler souls because they don't spend time on just one location period. And they never have. So it really varies a lot. Yeah. 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 I'm sure there is a reason why you mentioned the Pleiadians because um, I consider myself a Pleiadian starseed. Can can we use the IP souls and starseed interchangeably? In yeah, in my opinion, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in in fact, like my most popular video on YouTube is about the Pleiadians. And like I have a guided meditation as well that is like uh, one of the, my most popular. And so I, I I feel like there is a portion of the listeners um, that are interested in in the Pleiades, Pleiadians, and and star seeds. Uh, but also when I I did a, a star seed origin chart, and in the chart it confirmed um, that like most most of my coordinates were from the Pleiadians but there were also other minor coordinates from Orion and Mm -hmm. Lyra. So I I guess from my understanding, we can have different lives in different places. But like you said, maybe my higher self resides in the Pleiades. I don't know. Yes. I mean, it could be, Will, that your higher self is just a possibility. I never know until we do regression. Uh, uh, and yet intuitively, you may know the answers, even without regression. Um, it could be that your higher self resides in the Pleiades. Um, but there are two possibilities. One would be you've had past lives. You've had interplanetary past lives here and here and here and here. Um, that are all IP locations. That's a possibility. Or it could be that, you know, there's, my guides are talking to me in my head, there's another option, which I'll add in a minute, but that you basically spend most of your time um, in the Pleiades. And yet you also have spent some time as a soul, not just past lives, but your soul has traveled to one other place and spent time there, to two other places and spent time there. So it 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 really varies a lot. The, the piece that my guides were putting in my mind to say just now, um, let me say two things. One is I'm always learning more you know, give me three more months of working with clients and three months from now, because of my clients, I'm going to know more about IP souls or angelic souls because I learned from my clients. Um, But also what my guides were putting in my mind was about spacecraft. And I have lots of clients. Now, you know, the, the psychologist, Linda, 30 plus years ago, wouldn't be saying these kind of things. It would be like, that's the wonkiest thing I've ever heard. Well, it's obviously not wonky to me anymore. Um, So I have clients who during the regression um, experience their soul on a spacecraft. And I'm, I, what I'm about to say, I think is true trying to ground this, that some IP souls don't necessarily come from a location. They come from a spacecraft Hmm. that doesn't necessarily belong to a location. I think that's a possibility. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. And what I love about what you're describing your work is 
is that first you're learning from your clients and you're, you know, you're getting, you're gathering all the pieces of the puzzle through working with your clients. And also, I think it's really empowering for the client to access the information. Nothing wrong with mediums or or channels, but I, I think it's always more powerful to be guided into your higher self or Akashic records, however people name it. So I think it's really powerful. It, it, I, I, I often say exactly what you just said. I mean, I have a couple of very capable people I know in my life that are very capable channels. Um, and that's that's great. And I learn things from them. But where I prefer to gain the information and what I prefer for clients is what you just said, is that I guide the client and I don't tell them where they're going or what's going to happen. They tell me because as you would imagine, then it's a visceral, you get to have your own experience. It's like, okay, you could watch a documentary about life in Beijing, but if you go to Beijing, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have just a couple of questions before we finish. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, but I have one question about the the, the new waves of babies or, or children, because, mm -hmm. you know, we have the indigo rainbow crystal children or right. the star children. Are these babies IP souls? Is there any correlation yeah, I that's great um, for you to ask that. Y yes, I strongly suspect that those uniquely gifted and uniquely sometimes uniquely challenged children that we label as, as you said, indigo, rainbow, and so forth, um, I think I would bet almost 100% of the time those are IP souls. And what I do know, because I again, I hear this from clients, is that um, you see how to make this simple. Um, there is a push, if you will, right now in the higher realm, and this is coordinated. Um, there are councils of advanced souls that serve Earth. There's a there is an interplanetary council. There's an angelic council. There's a push for more IPs and more angelic realm souls, but just to focus on IPs, there's a push for more IPs to come to earth mm -hmm. because we we need the wisdom. And it used to be the case that IPs could um, materialize in a body and dematerialize. This is thousands of years ago. It's my understanding that is no longer energetically possible so that if a new group of IPs comes to earth, they have to come through the womb, through pregnancy and birth. That that more are coming because we need that perspective. Yeah, ascension, right? We're in the middle of this shift and we need help. <laughs> ex ex exactly, exactly. Awesome. I have like uh, just the final questions that I call them fun and deep. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions and whatever comes to your mind, you can just say it. Okay. Okay. Um, so what is your definition of soul? Mm -hmm. um, soul is an, it, it is an aspect of a higher frequency that grows and evolves and aids humanity and aids the expansion of the universe beautiful um linda what brings you joy in your life Ooh, um many things but i'll say um and i really mean this this is will sound kind of classic but um time with my grandchildren time with these younger people who are just having so many new experiences in life. So time with my 14 and 16 and 17 year old grandchildren. Beautiful. Um, imagine that all the books in the world were going to be destroyed and deleted forever. 
if you had to pick only one to save only one, which book would you save and why? Yeah, I recently did a list of the 10 books that had impacted me the most over the years. So the book that comes to my mind um, is uh, the book written by Viktor Frankl about his experience during the Holocaust called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, it, it Not only just for me, if you read about it, many people say it's the most impactful book they've ever read. So Man's Search for Meaning. What is the one thing that people would be surprised to know about you? Probably, you know, the, the, the majority of, of humans are not spiritual. People that are spiritual is a, a moderately small slice of the population. So probably what would surprise the average person is what fascinates me and why I do this kind of work and keep learning about what to some people would be pretty weird stuff, not weird to you, but weird to the general population. Right. Um, let's suppose that we sign contracts before coming into this life, which we talked about in this conversation, and then we choose what we came here to learn as well as to teach what would that be for you um how to put it into words uh, what it means to be a soul and how we plan our lives and why we're here mm -hmm. basically I'm sure, i'm sure your guides are proud of you <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the last one is called Three Truths, which is also a hypothetical question. But imagine that many years from now, um, you're about to make the transition um, from this physical realm into the spiritual realm. And everything that you've built, all the work that you've done, the books, the videos, the podcasts will be deleted. <laughs> and you have a piece of paper in your hands a pen, and you can write three truths. And these truths will live on, and it will be sort of your legacy for your children and your grandchildren and all humanity. What would you write in that piece of paper? Your, what, would, what would your three truths be? Mm, wow. Great questions. Um, well, this one is probably quite common, but I do believe uh, that it's true. Um, and, and, and love is really an insufficient word, but we don't really have any other word in our, in our human language. Um, love is really all that matters. Mm. That would be one. Um, for me, and this is not necessarily for everyone, but the second truth that comes to my mind um, for me, uh, and I know this is part of karma I've worked on in current life. I'm trying to think of how to word this. Supporting and loving children and grandchildren expanding, contributing to the next generations is crucial. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to have children or have grandchildren. You can be contributing to people younger than yourself without them being biologically yours. So um, aiding the next and supporting the next generations is crucial. Um and then what comes to my mind, the final truth would be, we must have joy in life. We must take time to do whatever it might be that brings us joy on some kind of a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. And to wrap up, can you let us know how we can work with you or if you want to share any courses, any books, any projects in the pipeline? 
Um, yeah, so people can find me and my work um, at my website, was, which is ravenheartcenter.com, ravenheartcenter.com. Um, I have a new virtual course starting in about 10 days. And these virtual courses are live and recorded. This is a four month virtual course. And what we're going to be looking at together and doing learning and teaching and experiential, obviously it's all based on soul, is um, how do we, uh, the, 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 the actual title of the course is um, grief, endings, grief, comma, endings, comma, and opportunities to evolve. So the whole course is about how do we utilize those, um, those losses, be it someone dies, um, we move, we uh, end a partnership, whatever. How do we utilize those endings as our soul's opportunity to grow? And that's what the whole course is going to be focused on. Yeah. Beautiful. So I'll add all the links in the description. I assume that's in your website, right? All the information. Yes. Yes, I'll absolutely. All, I'll put all the links in your YouTube, your Instagram, in the description. And Linda, it's been a delight to talk to you. Thank you so much. And I want to acknowledge you for the commitment to your work and commitment to your growth and for helping us humans to have a better understanding of our place and our role here on this life. So thank you so much for shining your light. Thank you. Yes. And thank you, Will, for what you do. Thank you for inviting me. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Much love. Thanks so much for watching or listening to this episode. If you would like to learn more about Linda's work, her workshops, her one-on-one sessions, please visit her website. It's www.ravenheartcenter, center, C-E-N-T-E-R dot com. You can follow her on Instagram as well at Raven Heart Center and also on YouTube. As usual, you can find the links on the show's notes. And please let us know in the comments what has been your biggest takeaway from this awesome, fascinating interview. And once again, if this has brought you value, please subscribe to my podcast or my channel. Share it with your friends, your Starseeds friends. And as always, keep shining your light. Keep your heart open. And let love lead the way. I love you. See you in the next episode. Bye.